Does the color of the sky mean anything special to you? It does to me. A hell of a lot. When I close my eyes, the sky in my dreams is a deep, dark blue. Pilots have been in my family for four generations. Flying's in my DNA. Even so, my grandpa didn't want me joining the Air Force. He lost faith in the Ocean Air Defense the day my dad died in battle. You know, Abby, I wish you could see what it's like up there. Cruising above the clouds, the dark blue of the stratosphere. Nothing beats being at the controls and seeing it from the cockpit. Look here. Gramps tossed a magazine over to me with an article. Unmanned fighters are no longer a dream, it read. Pilots taking to the skies will soon be a distant memory. I don't see anything good coming from that. Know what? Lying smack dab in the middle of the desert west of here, there's a bunch of planes from the last war. Some of them have been mothballed, but most of them are just rusted piles of junk waiting to be scrapped. Gramps was really good friends with the Super there, so he got to take whatever he wanted, no questions asked. That's how we got the parts to build our own plane. Now, when I say we, I mean me, my grandpa, and his old war buddies. I cut my teeth working with those geezers. They taught me their skills and some dirty jokes. But with their aging eyeballs and whatnot, I ended up having to do most of the work myself. I was at the airstrip doing some flight training when I saw it. A prototype drone. It wasn't much of a plane, more of a trash can with wings. Laugh at it all you want, kid. But technology's always changing. If you don't keep up with it, it'll leave your ass behind. It took six years and eight months to get that engine running. And it took us another year and a half after that to finally get the balance of the airframe just right. I'd gone from being a little girl to, well, still a girl, just older. But now, I was all alone. <sighs> Wherever the souls of my Gramps and his pals are flying, I hope it's peaceful. Then, finally, I was ready to break the sound barrier. All this plane could do was take off, accelerate, and fly up. fighters. They were tailing something. A drone. They were going full out chasing that thing. Doing 30 G's at least. Damn, I've never seen anything move that fast. It had a rose painted on it. The Erusian emblem. But that country's a whole continent away from here. Crap. should have been my best with you, piece of junk. should have built a return to... As of 1 p.m. today, the Kingdom of Erugia has declared war on the Ocean Federation. As soon as the news broke out, enemy aircraft began bombing Ocean territory, causing widespread destruction. The Air Defense Force has released a statement saying this violent attack was carried out by drones. 
They speculate the drones were secretly transported to Osea in shipping containers and launched remotely. The Secretary of the Navy has stated that the enemy was targeting naval ports across the country. According to the Secretary, all of the nation's aircraft carriers, including one still under construction, sustained severe damage in the attacks. We have yet to hear back from the Department as to the fate of Ocean carriers currently at sea. Hold on. I've just received breaking news. The International Space Elevator, which is being built in southern Yuzha, has been seized by the Erusian Army. Reports say former President Harling was touring the site at the time, but his current whereabouts are unknown. Our sources in government tell us it was Harling's policies regarding the space elevator that caused economic frictions in the area, and which ultimately led to this war. Located near Erugia, on the continent of Yuzha, the space elevator has been under construction for some time now. The Executive Office of the Ocean Federation has declared a national state of emergency. They have ordered all its armed forces, including Yuzhan peacekeepers, to mobilize and make the necessary preparations to launch an immediate counterattack. Ladies and gentlemen, our country is officially at war. Stay tuned for further updates. Breaking news from ENN. Osea launched an attack on the capital today, striking Farbanti from their aircraft carrier, the Kestrel II. After a brutal battle, the Erusian Air Force successfully repelled them. During the air raid, the Osean Air Force fired missiles at the city and managed to shoot down a number of Erusian fighters. Some of the disabled planes then crashed into residential areas. The world was screwed. Twenty years ago, the Earth got slammed by an asteroid. Yuja was on the wrong side of the planet and got hit. Hard. Refugees swarmed the Erujian Republic, the biggest country on the continent, plunging it into chaos. They were desperate and started a war, one they had no hope of winning. That's the war my dad fought and died in. The biggest nations from two continents went head to head, and the so-called righteous Oceans struck the deal that ended it. They fancied themselves the only nation that could bring peace and stability to the world. They even tried saving the Yuzhans, still suffering from the disaster. That's how a space elevator, stretching way up into the sky, ended up being built in Yuzha, paid for by the Oceans. President Harling said he did it out of compassion for his fellow humans. But to the folks in Erugia, it looked like Osea was moving in to take over. Erugia went from being a republic, back to being a kingdom. When they started this new war, they managed to get the drop on everyone. The second the declaration hit the news, Erugian forces took control of the space elevator without spilling a single drop of blood. President Harling was touring the elevator when it happened and disappeared. Then, while that was going on, the Erusian ships that were docked all around Osea released a swarm of drone fighters they had hidden on board in containers. No one thought they were capable of doing what they did that day. With pinpoint accuracy, they managed to take out everything that was military, and not a single civilian was hurt in the process. Osea pissed lots of people off with their huge military presence around the world. Erugia didn't have the same reach, but they could hit their targets faster and cleaner. And when all this was going down, I just so happened to be in my flying drag racer. In case you were wondering, yeah, I survived. I crashed in a bombed out Ocean Air Force base, then got arrested for breaking wartime aviation laws or some crap. The world went from being at peace to being at war, all in the blink of an eye. I was tried, found guilty, and stuffed into a cargo ship. For company, I had some court-martialed soldiers. And remember those mothballed planes I told you about before? 
They were loaded on the ship, too. We headed off down south for several days, and then swung east. That's how I got here. I was thousands of kilometers from Arugia, on the opposite side of the Yuzian continent. For a port, it was dull as hell. It had three rusty patrol boats. And the base? The fences were topped with razor wire, the tower had a searchlight and machine guns, and a truck with a gun turret was parked in front of the gate. Its gun was aimed at the yard. This was a prison. This place looked like a full-on base, but half the tanker trucks were just big balloons, and the runways weren't even paved, just painted on the dirt. The whole place was just one big fat lie. The only reason I was here is because they knew I'd restored a supersonic plane. They wanted me to make something out of the mothballed planes they brought, that they could park on the fake runway. Can you believe that shit? So, I tried to escape. <laughs> they found out. <laughs> and set the dogs on me. Here he comes. looking worse. Thank God he has his granddaughters here to help him out. They're sisters, 15 and 10. Engaging the enemy in combat so we could use his physiological data to improve the drones had always taken a toll on Mihai's body. But today, he was really showing his age. The drones we based on his data were being taken down at a faster rate now compared to when the war began. When Mihai found that out, he insisted on flying to the front lines to see it for himself. Sometimes he could be so stubborn. His age wasn't the only thing affecting his health. Over the years, flying at high altitudes for prolonged stretches of time had ravaged and poisoned his body. But he was a man of grit. Today, after 28 years, he saw combat again. If his flight suit still wasn't good enough to protect him, I can't imagine how many G's he hit today during the battle. As a pilot, he exceeds all our expectations. It's going to take a bit more tweaking before our drones can match his skill. How penal is this penal unit, you ask? This place is a shithole. If you took the stink of all the corruption in the world, then corralled it all in one place, that would give you a pretty good idea of what the air smells like around here. We got all kinds of critters, too. Everything from flea-ridden guards, rabid dogs, and a mechanic doing a stretch for life. I can't forget the rats. Yeah, we got those. And some pilots who got their wings clipped, too. One's a great pilot, but a lousy thief. One's a gambler with no luck and one's an anarchist with no balls. Their job here was to rev the engines on the fake runways. The idea was for Arusha's spy satellite to pick up the heat sig. Even though there weren't any real fighters here, it looked like it on their infrared. I bet you're wondering, if Arusha lost the war, how come they still have a spy satellite? Because someone over there was smart enough to train a bunch of computer nerds to hack into half of Osea's satellites. That's how come. Every now and again, I'd try to bust out. And every single time, those damn dogs would drag me right back. When I was in my cell, I'd hear this voice coming from the guards' room. It was the Erusian princess rallying her people on the Erusian national broadcast. All us prisoners had become big fans of hers. You want to hear something funny? The guards were big fans, too. I swear to God, every time she was on the air, they'd turn up the volume on the radio and sit there listening. I could see how someone like her could win the hearts and minds of soldiers and workers alike. When the princess said something, you could tell she meant every word. Lately, she'd been having more fun with her speeches, and that made her seem even more charming. You could say her charm was like a virus. 
Whenever she'd point out stuff that was wrong with Osia, the prisoners in here went nuts. Hell, if anyone knew how messed up Osia was, it was the prisoners. They'd shout, burn Osia down. No way am I just gonna sit here and rot away in this hellhole. Dark blue. Instead of building fake-ass planes to trick Arusia, I'm gonna build one that'll really take off. You can count on that. Bad news for us here at the prison. The enemy fell for our decoy base. With all the fake planes and trucks we had out, we must have looked to them like the Ocean Air Force was about to go on the attack. Day after day after day after day they bombed us. Osea didn't give a damn. We weren't soldiers to them, so go ahead. Bomb us. In their eyes, we were expendable. Worth less than the fake planes in the bunkers. No biggie. While I made fake planes, they had me put together some working ones. Then, some genius at HQ decided we should send it up, so the base looked legit. Thankfully, we had people to crew them. It didn't matter what we were locked up here for anymore. Top brass needed pilots, and criminals were all they had. A crook, a gambler, an anarchist. Just your typical lowlifes. They threw each one of them in a cockpit and sent them up to intercept the enemy's planes. But in the end, it was all just for show. So, up they went, day after day after day. Today they tossed someone new into the mix. Wonder what he did to get sent here. My dad died flying for the Ocean Air Force. When your allies are surrounded, one of the most dangerous missions is giving them cover to retreat. Whoever signed up for that was a real hero. But even more dangerous than that was being the one who had to cover the rear guard's retreat. That was my dad's job, and one time, he called it off. Said it was too late for him. Said anyone else would have done the same. I found that out from a war buddy of his when he came to tell me how my dad died. The next time a retreat happened, my dad volunteered to be in the rear guard. Dumbass. He died all right. No one came to help. The news nearly broke me. Of all the ways to get killed, that's got to be the most pathetic one ever. Am I right? There's a rumor going around about another inmate. A guy they brought here a little while ago. Get this. Talk in the cell block says he was sent here because he killed Harling. The president of Osea during the last war, remember? He's the one that sent my dad on that suicide mission. He's the reason I had to go live with my grandpa, and why me and Gramps started building a supersonic jet. He's the reason I ended up here. Maybe I should give that guy a thank you note for killing him. Nah. God, I hate the smell of this place. It's all fake and lies and bullshit. It reeks. Mihai's granddaughters like to keep to themselves, mostly. They were well-behaved and possessed a sort of quiet elegance. From time to time, I'd catch myself looking at them, wondering what they were talking about. I'm sure everyone on the base did the same. They were such enthralling creatures. Every night, a crowd would gather around Mihai. They were the men tasked with guarding him in the air. Their jackets all bore the same patch, a relic from a nation that was long gone. Decades ago, during the Age of Expansion, the Kingdom of Erugia absorbed many countries. Theirs was one of them. Mihai asked them, Yet what is a nation? Can we actually see the physical lines that divide one from another? People of my generation can no longer speak the language of our homeland. 
My grandparents always look sad when they see I have no idea what they're saying to me. Mihai didn't say a word after that. His scarred face betrayed no emotion. He didn't get those scars from flying, though. Mihai was originally from Shilaji. His real name is Mihai Dimitru Margarita Cornelio Leopold Blanca Carol Aeon Ignatius Rafael Maria Nikitas A. Shilaji. When he was young, he was the heir to the Grand Duchy of Shilaji. Then, revolution broke out among his people. Mihai was betrayed by a close friend who pointed a gun at his face and pulled the trigger. The revolution was successful, but the new country that sprang from it was annexed by the expanding kingdom of Arusia. The Arusian royal family allowed Mihai's family to retain their title and noble standing in the new kingdom. But Mihai surprised them all by signing up for the draft like an ordinary Arusian citizen. He was then accepted into the Air Force Academy by order of the king. Mihai soon became an ace pilot. When the royal family was ousted and Arugia became a republic, he continued his service for the new regime. Test sites soon flourished. One day, a classmate of Mihai's granddaughter visited. I noticed the rose emblem. She laughed like a princess, and I found out later she was indeed the daughter of Arugia's new ruler. She was the connection to the royal bloodline everyone was looking for, the one to restore the monarchy. This new princess was truly a godsend for the Arugian people. If Mihai's granddaughters were like the moon, she was like the sun, around which everything seemed to orbit. Her face was so expressive, it's no wonder the people of this war-torn country instantly felt at ease when they saw her speeches. They started singing. The pilots of the support plane smiled, even though they wished their nation were independent from hers. Angelic. I wonder how Mihai felt about all of this. It was my job to research his neurological data, after all. I wish I could figure him out. Whatever his feelings were about losing his homeland, he kept hidden. Even from me. I had a chance to talk to one of the pilots that escaped back here, so I took it. Apparently, two of our planes took the enemy on alone. They covered the Allies so they could retreat. The hell kind of idiot does a thing like that? The last pilot to land back at the base was that scrawny anarchist dude. He always had this dumb grin on his face, like he didn't give a damn about whatever he did to get thrown in here with the rest of us. Was he the one who went gung-ho? I bought him a drink later. After the usual small talk, I turned the topic around to the mission. For an anarchist, he struck me as a bit weird. Nothing like what I expected. He talked a mile a minute and kept going on and on about library books. Not encyclopedias, those cheesy adventure novels you read in high school. Nothing against those. I like a good story myself once in a while. But I wasn't here to talk books. I remember that day well. Amidst the swirling clouds, a fighter squadron was trying to help its allies reach safety. He's pretty foolish, isn't he? I thought so too. Suddenly, a highly skilled enemy fighter squadron appeared and began picking them off at the edges. One by one, they fell right out of the sky. Although, I guess there was nobody around that was even more foolish to go to their aid then. So, you simply watch things unfold from a distance. Yeah. I mean, who would have ever thought that I'd just go and follow him straight into the enemy squadron like that? 
After what felt like decades, I finally got to the info I was looking for. He wasn't the guy. He said he was just following his wingman's lead and managed not to die somehow. The hero on this mission was the new guy. The one that killed Harling. <laughs> How did you feel? I'm still kind of shaken up, actually. But you know, I do feel a certain sense of pride, too. He really is foolish, isn't he? Yep, he sure is. I went to the hangar to have myself a closer look at Trigger's plane. I knew that burnt smell. That's what happens when an engine's been driven to its limit. This pilot was a hot dog. From now on, I was gonna keep my eye on this idiot. From a distance, though. I didn't want to get too tight with someone who was a better pilot than my dad. Even so, I decided to give this guy's plane a little bit of the old Avril magic touch. He needed all the help he could get. Suddenly, we were being treated like a regular unit. We've been ordered to pack everything up and move the base further inland. We even got a transport plane. The funny thing is, no one here remembers I've got a bum leg and, oh, that I'm not a soldier. Take a look at the map. There's an island on the other side of Yuja our Marines landed on. The space elevator's not too far from there. They tell us the airfield's being used as a base to support the elevator. Not sure if I trust that intel. Anyway, the transport plane's gonna drop us there. Without any fighters to cover us. Some genius thought we could commandeer the enemy's jets they left in the hangars, and use those to fight. Y'all aren't real soldiers, they said. Any other day we'd be using you lowlifes to go out and dig up landmines. And prisoners don't get guns. You'll just have to make do with whatever we give you and like it. A phone. They don't let us prisoners near them. But with all the hustle and bustle of moving the base, they forgot to lock this one up. Looks like an antique. I lost my right for a phone call ever since I was arrested and locked up. It's trippy to think that I can just hook it up, dial a number, and talk to someone from my own country. Planning escapes ain't all I'm good at. I'm plenty good at remembering phone numbers, too. A little while later, I headed over to HQ. You must know. We did get a call direct from command. That pipe, what exactly are you doing with it? My grandfather had a lot of friends in the Air Force from his time as a lieutenant. My point? Well, you're going to set out in your own special aircraft. Then you'll send everybody else off in the wrong direction while you head somewhere else. <sighs> All right, fine. But just you and you alone. You're the only one allowed on board. Besides, there's only one seat left. I said, cool. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I was born downtown, in our capital. When I recall my homeland, my thoughts are filled with the sights and sounds of the city. But home means something different to each and every one of us. Therefore, I've decided to visit every place where our citizens call home. The kingdom of Arugia is a land of diversity. Each region has its own unique and special culture.
Mihai's second sortie was designed to calculate how his physiology changed under the stress of combat. My job was to compare his performance as a pilot now to when he was younger and understand how his skills evolved. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure I wanted to know the answers anymore. For a man his age, Mihai's body was unbelievably resilient, remarkably flexible. His reflexes were as sharp as they ever were. Still, after all those years of flying in the outer layers of the atmosphere, even someone as strong as Mihai wasn't immune to the effects of the strain. The human body is fragile. It was not meant to handle the excessive amounts of radiation that constantly bombarded the stratosphere. For Mihai's second sortie, we used a flight suit that was still untested. He seemed fine on takeoff, but by the time he landed back at the base, he was clearly a mess. He got caught in a surprise dogfight with an especially stubborn enemy. It took a while for Mihai to bring him down. The suit was ineffective. According to the data, it wouldn't let him fly to his full potential. A new flight suit was made to my exact specifications. When it finally arrived, Mihai's granddaughters glared at me with their disapproval. They blamed me for the pain their grandfather had to keep enduring. But Mihai remained stoic. He wasn't the type of man who cared about anything that happened here on the ground. I wasn't worried about it. I was confident the new suit would protect him thoroughly so that he could maneuver his plane any way he wanted. The moment he took off in his new flight suit, I realized what I had failed to before. Right after takeoff, as the wheels retracted, the plane suddenly arced up. It accelerated so quickly. I had never seen a plane move like that before. Mihai hit the high G's multiple times before disappearing into the blue. The support team couldn't even keep up. And then I knew. I understood why he never seemed to care about restoring his stolen country back to its former glory, and why he didn't seem to care about anything that happened here on the ground. Of course, Mihai's kingdom was the sky. As far as the chaos we find ourselves in these days, it's difficult to say which side pulled the trigger first. Arugia deployed an automatic intercept system with drones. Osea implemented long-range attacks to bypass them, so Arugia decided to sabotage Osea's communications and navigation technology. Arugia couldn't launch a satellite themselves, but they were still able to hack the software of the Osean transmission and navigation systems. Before Osea even noticed, half of their satellites were hijacked. That's when things got ugly. In an attempt to knock out each other's capabilities, both forces launched fighters loaded with anti-satellite missiles at the same time. Only military satellites were targeted. However, their destruction created a debris field in orbit which wiped out scores of other satellites, both private and government-owned. What kept the world relatively sane up to that point had been free-flowing data and information. But now, those were gone. All that remained was chaos and confusion. Government and civilian broadcasts and transmissions were cut off. The flow of information had ceased. Forces on both sides of the conflict now found themselves unable to communicate with their superiors. Many of the smaller countries annexed by Arugia and yearning for their independence seized the opportunity and started their own uprisings. As for why some of Osea's military decided to break off from the main force and continue on their own, I have no idea. Perhaps there was some sort of dispute over the chain of command. 
The continent that had once seen wars that were only fought between Osea and Rugia was now full of numerous conflicts between rival leaders vying for power. Insurgencies were everywhere. I even heard a rumor that a group of Osean convicts had rebelled. Rumors. It never ceased to amaze me that even at a crazy time like this, something as trivial as a rumor could find its way here. Communications from corporate were cut off. Apparently, the entire computer network was down. It was a wise decision to make our drones autonomous with AI instead of being radio controlled. Wise and forward thinking. Even with their GPS offline, they can still use their sensors to navigate as long as they're working properly. I'm sure the drones are still working perfectly, following their mission orders to the letter. I wish I could upload Mihai's new data to them, but without a connection, I can't upload the software to the active drones. The new ones we're making, though, there should still be enough time to upgrade those before they're activated. I'll be taking the data I've acquired away from the front lines now. Oh, and I'll be taking the girls too. I told my assistant Masa it was time to get Mihai's granddaughters ready to leave here. She's not much older than the girls, but she has a way about her, and I'm sure she won't have any trouble with them. I saw a plane flying off in the distance. I imagine it was looking for a safer place. The plane had a rose emblem on it. The island we went to was supposed to have been secured by the ground forces. They hadn't gotten a handle on things by the time we got there, so now we were stuck in the middle of a half-assed campaign. My job was to get the planes ready for combat, making repairs and handing them over to our troop of cons. Thing is, the enemy still had the hangars. The comms were still down, so none of us knew what the hell was going on. The last transmission I heard before everything went to shit was that some prisoners from an Ocean military penal unit rioted and managed to escape. They stole some jets, and now they were flying around, taking out their former allies left and right. I wonder if any units like ours were out here, creeping around. Hearing the Ocean jets firing at each other overhead chipped away at morale. Since the radio was out, it was quiet. I liked it better that way. All I heard was the gunfire. Here we were, walking around carrying rifles. We were pilots, damn it. Friendly fire will probably kill us. You know things are desperate when the guards that used to lock us into solitary are now telling us it's better we all stick together. I guess they think our odds of surviving this war are better that way. After walking for miles across the battlefield, we came across the wreckage of a plane. Passenger, not military. I knew that rose. It was an erosion liaison plane. The guard's dogs smelled something and took off. They led us to a cliff. And the bodies. Today, I lost everything. When Osea attacked our capital, my father, a man who was never really suited to being the king, was killed. I was to be flown out of the war zone to safety, but the plane was shot down by rebels. The entire crew was killed in the crash. Soldiers appeared and one shot at me. My dog went after him and shot him to pieces. He was my best friend. After all those speeches I gave about working together for peace, I thought everyone felt the same as I did. I'm sure the soldier who shot at me knew I was the princess of Arugia. He was Arugian too. More soldiers have come. Now, there is no one left to protect me. I am so numb, I cannot move. 
watch as one of their dogs approaches and sniffs mournfully at my dead friend. I wonder if it grieves for him as much as I do. I can barely think. I feel weaker by the minute. I don't know who these soldiers are with, but I managed to take a sip of the water they gave me. How long have you been here? Somehow, I muster the courage to answer the woman's question. I tell her I've been there three days. They gather around me with grim looks on their faces. What would they do if they knew I was the Erosion Princess? After searching the cockpit of the plane, the woman who spoke to me before came back to me. This is an air-to-ground tactical radio. It still works! I noticed she walked with a limp. She knelt down next to me and asked her companions to give me some food. And then, very softly, she said, You see, I used to listen to your broadcasts, your royal highness. Just what did you see here? We found a boat, then sailed away from the island. We had to. We didn't belong there. The new guy's name was George. I noticed when the anarchist said his name, he said it with a thick Belkan accent. How did you know that he was from Belka? Well, both my parents were from Belka, so... You never told me that. They say that Belkans are known for their conspiracies. That's just a stereotype. Now, I simply stated my honest opinion and was thrown in jail for it. The princess sat there looking miserable. That was a dumbass stunt she pulled back there, but it got us on this boat. Take a look at that. This ship is heading for a single rope that's hanging down from the sky. Do you know how far the end of that rope reaches? Outer space? No. It is a direct connection to the very potential of mankind itself. Or at least it was until war erupted. It's my strong belief that the rope might be connected to a very distant, faraway source of, of great conflict and strife. Even long before the war, the whole world started falling apart once Harling began trying to build it. I often wonder, what was going through Harling's mind when, when he was trying to destroy the very thing that so many people were sacrificed in order to create. Sacrificed? What do you mean? Have you seen all of those countless old space shuttles on Tyler Island that are no longer in use? Yeah. <laughs> I always thought of them as a good source of scrap. They're an obsolete technology that was abandoned during the construction of the space elevator. Which would mean that if the space elevator was destroyed, it would be that much harder for mankind to reach the stars, until we find another way. But even then, Harling still went ahead and tried to destroy it. At the cost of his own life. That's not the way I heard it. What I heard was that he sacrificed himself to protect the tower from an incoming missile. Oh. I was told he tried to fly his ship into the tower in order to destroy it. I wonder which story is true, your royal highness. I don't know. Looking at it objectively, it's reasonable to believe that Harling had both options before him. 
When it comes to which one you think he took, I guess it's like a mirror. Yes, it is. It's like a mirror looking into your own soul, based on whichever choice you believe it was. At the moment, though, I can only see darkness. I think... I think that thing should be destroyed. When we got to the mainland, we found the space elevator's support facility. I guess this was the factory where they built the gigantic structure the elevator traveled in. There was this little girl sitting in front of a mural. When the princess saw her, she shuddered like she'd seen a ghost. The girl had a stuffed animal. This was the day after the shit went down at Tyler Island. She walked right up to the princess, took her hand, and led her into the factory. One thing's for sure, they knew each other. The factory had been converted to a production line for Erujian drones. It was fully automated and chugging along, making drone after drone after drone. Once they got inside, the princess stopped and just stood there. Another girl was there with a man in a lab coat. He was trying to use his keyboard, but she wouldn't let him. She took a data chip and threw it on the ground. Then she walked over to us and took the gun from the prison guard's holster. She pulled the trigger and destroyed the chip. Later, I found out that the girl with the gun and the one with the stuffed animal were sisters. They were also the granddaughters of Mihai A. Shalaji, the legendary pilot. Gramps used to talk about him. He said Mihai was the top ace from two wars ago. Know any Belkins? Because this guy was a Belkin, and they love to stir shit up. Pitting nations against other nations is a particular favorite of theirs along with developing hyper-advanced technology. That's right. I'm Belkin, born and raised. My country is gone now. Rather than surrender to its enemy, Belka detonated seven nuclear weapons on its own soil. My people scattered around the globe, living in the shadows of other countries. We had a new purpose, to breed wars. The theory was that through war, we could achieve our destiny and our revenge. I had just finished inputting Mihai's data when his granddaughter came in. She destroyed the only copy I had of the information I squeezed out of him. The girl loved Mihai. No one knew more than her just how hard I pushed her grandfather for that data, how much I made him sacrifice in the process. I promised his granddaughters that his efforts were not in vain, that it could end this terrible war. But in the end, it only caused more chaos and despair. We were responsible for all this damage, all this tragedy. Now, we were going to pay for it. The Erujians, once our allies, would see to that. I had lost the drive to continue my work, even before I noticed Mihai's granddaughters eyeing me with suspicion that one day. I should have stopped then, for all our sakes. Mihai's granddaughter tossed the gun aside. She said if she resorted to killing, she'd just end up like the rest of us. And by us, she meant everyone, including the princess. Like me, the princess was afraid to look into the girl's eyes. She knew that by encouraging her people, she kept the war going. Mihai and his granddaughter were victims of it, and now, they too were paying the price. Is this for Belka? Or for Arugia? 
My grandfather had only one wish, to continue soaring through the endless skies. That was the only place where he felt alive. But I don't even have a country to call home, let alone the sky. The Black Forest, the lake, they are no longer mine. Even though those lands were once cherished by my late mother, we have to learn to put that sense of nostalgia behind us and behave like mature adults. My homeland. She's right. It feels so far away now. The woman with the rifle approached me. She was focused on more pressing issues. I checked the computer. All of the data on the legendary ace had already been installed. No, I pulled it before it was completed. However, there are two aircraft that are already scheduled to be manufactured based on that data. We must destroy the factory. This isn't the only one. There are more facilities just like it. And the two planes containing the data will be manufactured at one of those facilities. So, this place runs on solar power that the space elevator generates, right? How about the others? We can destroy the space elevator and cut the power to them. First things first, let's take this one out. I'll show you which locations to target. I stood there, thinking about that mural by the factory's entrance. Harling commissioned it to be painted. I realized that in the background, behind the dancing figures, the artist had painted several space elevators. I understand now. The space elevator wasn't designed to exploit Erugia after all. Good. And afterwards, we'll bring down the space elevator itself. No matter why it was built, right now, it's the root of this chaos. I wonder... Yes? I wonder... which path you would choose... when looking at Harling's mirror. I can't just snap my fingers and make a plane. Believe me, I wish I could. Right now, we needed one. Bad. When we were coming over on the boat, I remember seeing an aircraft carrier. That gave me an idea. The Admiral Anderson. The name of an old sailor. When the first drone started attacking, the ship wasn't ready for battle yet. It was still in the dock, getting all rigged up. So they rushed to get her ready. I know about Anderson. In the previous Ocean War, he was the commander of a ship that sent out the last fleet of jets. They say the deck was sloping so bad as it sank, the last plane barely made it off. Those fighters ended the war. That story gives me a little bit of hope, especially at a time like this. We're all in the same boat, like it or not. If this war keeps going on like it is, It'll be the end of everything. The military loaded this thing to the rafters with planes. Some were fighters that were going to be delivered to bases in occupied territory. It was hit before it could complete the mission. Jackpot. The hangars were loaded with goodies. This scrap queen's got work to do. The refugees built the settlement for themselves at the base of the space elevator. 
A humanitarian mission from Yuktuvania airdropped some supplies for them again today. Thanks to the princess, the whole world was pitching in to help these people. Handing out the relief supplies would have been a perfect gig for that anarchist dude. But since he's dead now, the job went to the guy from Belka, George. I guess Tabloid got that new system he wanted in the end. Mihai's granddaughters are helping out too. Mihai. That cranky old geezer's here with us too. I never wanted to create anything, and now here I am, clinging to life. Watching as my grandchildren and their generation make a new future for themselves and the world. Is this my punishment then? All I do is lie here, wasting away. I'll never know the freedom of flying the open skies ever again. I've been grounded, and my wings have been clipped. You know what having peace in the world means? It's being able to die in your own bed at a ripe old age. Peace is what those girls are working so hard for here. We got a bunch more refugees today. And the princess? She's looking to the stars. Dark blue. To the heavens and beyond. Can you hear me?